Welcome to episode 55 of the Series About Security podcast for September 12, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined again by Keith Watson and Mike Hill. We were off last week, so don't worry. Uh, we were too lazy to record. To record. They were too lazy to record. We were too lazy to record. We were too lazy to record. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we have a, I think, exciting episode uh, this week to we make up for. Saved up the news right. just yeah. for this one. Yes, and, and Keith is going to lead us into today's topic. Okay, so uh, over the past few months now, uh, due to Edward Snowden's uh, release of various uh, secret information about what the NSA does as in when he was a contractor to them. Uh, last week, on the 5th of September, we had another revelation printed by ProPublica, The Guardian newspaper, and The New York Times related to the NSA's campaign against encryption. And basically what they've been doing is spending about $250 million a year trying to weaken and in some cases insert back doors into encryption products. And when they can't do that, they ask for uh, keys to certificate authorities, and when they don't get those, they actually have, according to allegedly, uh, tried to break into various uh, infra- uh, internet service providers and copy those keys. The whole purpose of this is if you can't break the strength of the encryption used by whoever you're targeting, what if you weaken it? Or what if you acquire the keys necessary to put yourself in the middle so you can see all the communication traffic? And so this revelation is really about the agency's effort to get access to encrypted data. And they've used a variety of ways to do that. And some of the more interesting stuff is you know, weakening standards that we use for encryption. Um, there's some, uh, you know, some allegations of that. Uh, NIST uh, this week came out and said that they did, that's not part of their program, and they're opening up some of their encryptions for encryption standards for further review, just to make sure that's not actually happening. And um, probably the, one, the more shocking one is the insertion of backdoors into security products. This one is a particularly pressing issue for myself because we do use a lot of encryption products or products that have encryption components to them as part of our effort to secure the infrastructure and protect information. But if our security vendor is in having backdoors and weaknesses placed in their products, and the, the assumption is you know, the NSA is the only one that has access to that, but as anything, when you insert a backdoor, it's not always necessarily the intended uh, recipient of that beneficial backdoor uh, being the only one using it. So that's a significant concern for me and, and the job I have. So um, There's a lot here to talk about, but uh, that's basically the nuts and bolts of it. And I should point out the, the GCHQ, which is the British government's equivalent to the NSA, is also implicated in this. And some of the slides that were shared um, were from the GCHQ, um, highlighting some of the collaboration that, that they have had with the NSA. So, there it is in a nutshell, and it's some pretty scary stuff. <coughs> well, I'll, I'll start off by saying <coughs> the, uh, you know, the NSA director made a response to this, and basically, you know, just to summarize it, it's along the lines of, you know, we need to do this to do our job. We need to be able to decrypt data. You know, we need to see what the terrorists are writing. This is fundamental to our job. And, you know, we're not really, you know, it's not really our position to share our secrets of how we do these things. Um, what I find very ironic and interesting in all of this is, earlier in the article, it talks about how Edward Snowden did not have the classification level to view these documents. And yet, somehow he did. Somehow he was able to leak these documents. Um, so, you know, basically, I think the NSA say, trust us. Well, Edward Snowden was one of their contractors, one of their guys, um, who should not have been able to see it, but he did. So, 
you know, what you're saying, you know, in certain back doors, trust us, nothing bad can happen. Well, not the way they envision it. They, they envision they're the only ones using the back door, but guess what? Back door uh, on some of these uh, technological giant sites like Facebook and Google and, and everything, uh, those could be used for competitive advantages. If there's, if there's weaknesses that exist and back doors that exist, there's a, uh, a large population out there that would love to exploit that and take advantage of it. So, you know, while we're being assured at least that, you know, it's good American citizens and we have nothing to hide, there's nothing to fear, you know, they're not, you know, they're not really interested in our communications, these back doors can be used against us in other ways that they probably have not even envisioned. Well, I, one comment I have is uh, about encryption is that it involves a lot of trust doing just doing encryption. I mean, when you generate an encryption key, you're trusting the random number generator on your computer. You're trusting that the cryptographic libraries you're using have not been have to, don't have a backdoor and are generating the strongest possible random prime numbers or whatever sort of sort of encryption system you're using in it. And if one of these systems is compromised or backdoored, then the weak your 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 encryption mechanism just becomes weaker just automatically. So for example, if the NSA was able to get a a weak random number generator on a system that would reduce their search space for a brute force attack, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it wouldn't, and if nobody else knew it, then it, you could argue it wouldn't necessarily weaken the encryption for anybody else trying to break it, because they wouldn't know that it was But, you know, the thing about it is these security research, these cryptographic people find this stuff. Mm -hmm. They find weak random number generators. They find weaknesses in cryptography. And eventually, stuff like this will come out, and the bad guys will start using it. And then, and then, you know, whoever is behind it will say, oh, that was a bug. Sorry about that. And you have to wonder, um, looking back, I mean, how many of these weaknesses that were discovered were intentional. Right, and so there's two sides to this. You've got commercial products and you've got open source products. And where the open source products may have a little more, uh, a fewer eyeballs looking at them, looking for problems, <clears throat> even in crypto uh, libraries, they're not easy to spot. <clears throat> so it's highly likely and possible that somebody working as a, as a source code contributor could insert code that could compromise the output in some way that weakens it. And it would be hard to detect. I'm not saying there are such things, but there's a possibility of that. Especially if you look at a, at a library like the OpenSSL library, which many of our products uh, rely on, uh, that library has had many different patches made available to it to patch security issues with it. So while we do have people looking for problems in tools like that, the, there's still a lot of possibility that programs like it could have issues like that. And if you may recall from uh, many years ago, there was an, uh, an allegation that uh, a source code contributor to OpenBSD actually worked for the FBI and had backdoored the OpenBSD operating system in some way. And there was a big uh, headache over that, and and so one, a couple of people got together and started reviewing source code, and they they did not find anything. That's not to say there wasn't anything; they just didn't find it. But now let's look at commercial products. If if a commercial security vendor is a U.S. based company, then it's according to this very likely that the NSA has gone to them and asked them to put in back doors to that product. And also, don't talk about it. Why would you? Right? Well, they're not allowed. They're, they're not, not allowed, allowed to, to talk about it. Allowed. And that's one of the big controversies right is. now. Is you know they're filing petitions to say let us at least say under what mechanism we we and that we've done and, and that, that works for um, a provider like a Facebook or a Yahoo perspective. They want to talk about it right. because their their users' privacy and their future business is at stake. 
But if you're a commercial encryption software vendor and you say, oh yeah, we've got backdoors in our <laughs> yeah, <I> know. <laughs> you would not be in business next year. Well, I, I, <coughs> and I also question the term backdoor. I'm wondering if it's really a backdoor, if it's just a weakening. Well, a weakness system. is a backdoor. I mean, yes, when you it have is a backdoor. Process you can, available to you, like a, an organization like the NSA, any weakness. Is right. Backdoor. And, and, and you can, and I think you can create backdoors of products without them ever being discovered. True. In a sense, if the NSA knows something about how you created a key, for example, mm -hmm. they can use that. Oh, yeah, sure. Brute and, force and, or find out what the key is. Not only that, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that the NSA takes every commercial encryption product and open source ones out there and does a full evaluation to see if there are any existing weaknesses. And they hope that whoever developed it doesn't find those weaknesses. Yeah. I mean, it can, so they can take like the NSA can say, instead of using random numbers, use these numbers. These numbers. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, your, your random number seed is one. Yes. <laughs> for, for example, yeah. For example, yes. Well, instead of randomizing, pool, use, use these numbers. Your entry pool, pool is, is always starts at one, and, and you increment the date after that. Right, and that would be yeah, that sure. would be nearly impossible to discover as a back door. I mean, not in the your product you don't have code for. Sure. Yeah, your key would be pretty much. I mean, in, in the output of any crypto product is going to look like in the output of any other crypto product. It's not going to be obvious that there's a weakness. But right. if you know what the weakness is, you can reverse it back exactly. and, and recreate the conditions in which that message was created, and then you can figure out the key. So, so or at least a range of what the key possibilities are. So, so I want to play devil's advocate just a little bit for, for the MSC. Please. Uh, because I, I think it's an interesting viewpoint. I think it's an interesting conundrum they're in, though. I mean, there is a legitimate need for them to be able to monitor some traffic, or at least you can make the case of, you know, they have suspected terrorists. They want to be able to, you know, intercept that communication and decrypt it. I mean, there is there's a legitimate reason there, but their approach is really what's under question here. Um, and Edward Snowden has kind of added another level to it by disclosing it. So now we're having these conversations, which I think are good. But they, the NSA has also mentioned the fact that now that some of this stuff's been exposed, you know, now the, the bad guys know kind of what they're doing and can circumvent it. So um, what would you suggest? What do you guys think the NSA should be doing? Um, you know, because there is a certain amount of this, I think, that does need to be kept private. But I think they're also facing a serious backlash because we know now they're intercepting a ton of traffic and now we've learned they have ways to decrypt that traffic. So essentially there's really nothing private or there's a lot of information that was considered to be private that is now essentially uh, they're able to decrypt and, and read and interpret. I mean are they interested in our banking records? Probably not so much but the fact that they can just go ahead and but they, can really, get, they can just get to it if they want to is interesting. I think that's what's uncomfortable for the American people. But I've seen other arguments that say, hey, we want to stop terrorism. We need to let them do this. And if, for them to be able to do it adequately, they have to be able to decrypt anything. So it seems like an interesting position. There are conflicting <laughs> missions with the NSA. One of their missions is to make sure that the U.S. government communications are secure. And one of the ways they do that is they work with NIST to create standards and say, Here's a good set of algorithms to use. Here's the right way to use them. These are standards. So that's part of the mission. It's a smaller part than it used to be. And then there's the other part that says, we're going to go out and break as much encryption out there that we need to, or any we can get our hands on. And so that's, there are two conflicting missions here, and one is definitely larger than the other. So that's a problem. Um, the other is this vacuuming approach where it's like, well, we don't know who's talking about terrorist stuff out there, so let's just vacuum it all up and we'll analyze it. And as we keep giving them more and more money and they build huge data centers out in Utah, they have the capacity to do that, which is scary, but they do. Uh, so they need to be more targeted, I guess you could say, in what they're looking for and they say they have rules, they follow what the FISA court says, uh, but even James Clapper before Congress said there are times where our analysts unwittingly, unwittingly read stuff they're not supposed to. And if you go look at the Inspector General report, it was like a thousand times in a year. 
So there's a trust issue here, and for as much as they claim they're being the good guys and they're looking for bad stuff, uh, I, we're not really trusting them right now. Partly because of these revelations that we're finding out about, partly because uh, the, the government uh, has kept all the secret, and that they've gone back to commercial companies and say, we need to know more about your users. We need to know about how we can put back doors in your products. Oh, and don't tell anybody. Well, and that's a problem. Well, and that's the part that, that's interesting to, to me is how they're able to. I mean, I can imagine, you know, I have a good imagination how they kind of coerced or put pressure on these companies, but it seems like there was really no choice in it for them either. Um, no choice for the company. Yeah, and, 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 and yet they can't even disclose things. And this, would, this can. I don't know how much it will, but it, it can affect them in the future here. I mean, these, you know, it, as more things are revealed, people are, I think, losing trust, as you said. Uh, I also think it's interesting, you know, uh, the article was mentioned in the 90s, the whole uh, kind of clipper chip and, you know, how the NSA wanted essentially kind of a permanent backdoor for them to all traffic that they lost. Yes. And yet they just moved forward and did it anyway. And, and, it may, and that's to me where the trust issue really is. The NSA right now can come out and say all kinds of things, but I think as the American people, it's kind of like, okay, are you just saying that to kind of have face value and you're going to still push forward on achieving what you defined as your mission? And as you said, just backing up all the data that they can, and, and, and they, they want to capture it all and they want to be able to read it. So, yeah, and will they, they change anything? And <laughs> while they can capture their unencrypted data, they have to delete it after a period of time. If it's encrypted, they don't. They can hold on to it for as long as but, they But here's the trust issue. And how do we know they can break it later? That they're building future data centers. centers. How do we really I, I know? I said that's the rule. That's, that's that the rule. Really practical. Well, there's also, there, and there was also another article, um, speaking of the trust issue, that the NSA is uh, essentially giving data to Israel, including yes. data on Americans, and uh, with absolutely no restrictions on its use by the Israelis. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you have to wonder if it's like, well, we can't spy on Americans, but you can. Yes, that is a concern. <laughs> uh, there's also a concern about routing networks, uh, network traffic through Canada, and then counting it as foreign traffic. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> 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 there's that. Um, yeah. So, well, I mean, it's hard to trust anything. With the, I mean, this revelation essentially means, what do I trust? I mean, yeah, and maybe a future episode of ours will be a continuation of. I mean, we can say we can, we can, we can say use TrueCrypt, but if you generate over at a key on Windows, you know yeah. maybe they've compromised the encryption stuff within Windows. Maybe they've even compromised the encryption stuff within the Intel chip and the hardware yeah. and the hardware encryption. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to know how far. It goes, yeah. and they won't say anything. They're not going to say no. anything. The NSA's policy is to deny everything, or actually, they don't even deny everything. It's just they no comment on everything, so they don't they don't confirm or deny anything. So they just let the rumors fly, and you know. So another article which we posted, which kind of came out later um, on Forbes, was a discussion about how all these revelations are going to hurt American business. Because if you have, um, whether you're a service provider, like the size of Google or Facebook or Apple or Microsoft, and you, or you're a, a you know, security tool vendor, if you're in the US, it's gonna be assumed that there's a backdoor somewhere that the NSA put it in. And that if you're a foreign company and you're looking to do business with a company that is in the US, you might think twice about it. And it's again trust. How can you trust these products from American companies when the law allows them, the law allows the NSA and other government agencies to come in and, and um, to make certain demands on the products and services and also uh, gag the people involved so they can't even talk about it. Well, I have so, comments on that as well. Oh, please. Basically, please. can you think of any, I mean, OS that's being written? Today, that isn't a U.S. company who's writing it. Commercial? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's not many. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, your 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 choices are 
are, are not there as far as, as far as that goes. If you're using Microsoft or Mac or Android or whatever, even Linux is open source, so I mean they can they can meddle in there yep. too. So what what choices do you have? I mean, if, if, they, if they've been able to go that far and essentially compromise the operating systems themselves, then what do you do? Yeah, that is a conundrum. Yeah, and, and again, back to the, the devil's advocate position, because it's just so fun to do. <laughs> you know, um, if there's a need for them to be able to decrypt data, you know, the, the bad guys are using the same technology. So to me, that's the real issue is if, 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 if there's a legitimate need that they have to be able to do it, they're going to find a way to do it. It's going to, I think it's a hard thing to target. I mean, I think they can maybe do a little bit better job in targeting it. They are vacuuming everything up. But at the end of the day, we're all using similar operating systems, similar technologies. And if they need to break that, if, you know, assuming that Congress said, yes, you need to be able to do that, we give you permission to do that. I mean, are there other avenues they can take to do that other than what they kind of have? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying one way or the other, but I'm saying from, the, from their perspective, you can see why they might have taken this approach and why they would not want to talk about it. Um, because talking about it just gives the bad guys information, you know, they they learn they can learn more about what the NSA is doing and try to avoid it. Well, yes, from their perspective, this is fantastic. I imagine. I mean, before it came it came out, I, I mean, don't see too many terrorists logging in there. Google. I mean, you know, they 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 can they can they can break yeah, encryption that we previously thought was pretty much unbreakable by them. I mean, it's essentially you know what 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 they can do and and I think that was they if they 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 were pretty happy sitting on this oh yeah you know we we can't we can't break that right and which is which is true if it wasn't you know if it wasn't weakened in, in some in some manner or fashion well so, you know I, <laughs> I mean I'm sure they're fine with having the illusion that this stuff can't be broken I'm sure they were. Well, that would be ideal. That would be the ideal scenario. Oh, yeah. Use sure, this. It's sure. strong. can never be broken, not even by our government. Yeah. And, and, and all the while, have to kind of... See that marking. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, they want to, you know, to me, they want to lead people to it. And now, now, one other thing that, that occurred to me with these companies as well is, one other reason I can think why the NSA would want them to stay quiet is maybe it's not as extensive as we're all led to believe. And it's good for the NSA to, maybe it's also good for them to promote this image of nothing safe. Well, in reality, maybe it's not quite as bad as everyone's led to believe. At least that's what the, the companies okay. want you to right. believe, right? So maybe, sure, sure. Maybe, maybe part of it is, no, 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 I don't want you to t say what you agreed with because we're, we're enjoying this perception. I don't know that they are, but maybe they're enjoying the perception of nothing's safe. So, you know, don't use these technologies move over here, and they've already got something set up over you here. Might be right. That could be, it could be a huge <laughs> disinformation campaign. They could be. To get them to use they something that's even weaker. <laughs> Perhaps. And there might be something to that. I don't know. Um, yeah, so it's interesting stuff. I do know that I did see a blog post from... Uh, former Solaris network engineer who worked on the kernel team and he commented that he was never once asked to insert backdoors or weaken anything in the Solaris IPsec uh, implementation. So <clears throat> I don't know if that means anything, but from his perspective, it, he was never asked to do that. But that was, was a while ago that, that IPsec got into Solaris. So. I don't know if we'll see other engineers coming out and saying, oh, oh yeah, I put a backdoor in or yeah. No, I was never asked to do that. Something tells me you're not going to hear any of that. Yeah. Not if they're still employed by the same company. Yeah. But if the company doesn't exist anymore, you never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I'm trying to give you more of the secrets here. <clears throat> any of those, well, you know, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, but I guess in the case of Solaris, that's one of those things you probably let out now. Right? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything well, else? Well, on that depressing note. <laughs> anything else? 
and just more ranting, but you've yeah. already heard that. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we can continue this discussion uh, next week or something like that. It seems like we still have a lot to talk about. I'm, I'm really not sure about like a tools episode because it seems like nothing's safe. What was your choice? Exactly. I did see an interesting uh, blog post by Bruce Schneier. Um, talking about doing encryption with an air gap. I thought it was interesting. I didn't read it all that close, but something about where he's got a computer totally isolated and he does his encryption on it, then he upload, you know, takes it and feed it like a USB. Well, one of the articles, <laughs> I think so. it was the article, <laughs> did say encryption is still, encryption if implemented correctly, it's still mm -hmm. safe. Yeah. It, it, the problem is it's not, it's being weakened it's intentionally. Yeah. yeah. So, well, on that note, uh, thanks <laughs> to Mike. And Keith, I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.